G residency at Cedar Sinai Medical Center in Los Angeles. And this was followed by not one, not two, but three fellowships at um, MD Anderson uh, Cancer Center. She first did uh, a fellowship in surgical pathology, um, then in hematopathology, and finally a fellowship in molecular pathology. Um, she stayed on at MD Anderson, where she's currently assistant professor in the department of hematopathology. Um, Dr. Logavi is a member of multiple committees of national professional organizations, including the Educational Committee of the International Clinical Cytometry Society, ICCS. Um, she is the committee chair of the ECOG Akron Myeloid Malignancies Precision Medicine Initiative. Um, Dr. Logavi is a member of multiple committees of national professional organizations, including the Educational uh, Committee of the International Clinical Cytometry Society. Um, she um, is the committee chair of the ECOG Akron Myeloid Malignancies Precision Medicine Initiative. And personally, I've had the pleasure of serving with Dr. Logawi on the Outreach Committee of the International Clinical Cytometry Society. Uh, she has won numerous honors, including the Shannon Timmons Fellowship Award in Leukemia Research. And last year, she was selected to the 40 under 40 group of the American Society of Clinical Pathology. Uh, Dr. Logawi has received both internal funding for research as well as external funding from organizations such as ECOG. Um, Dr. Logawi's productivity is truly astounding. Uh, in a relatively short amount of time, she has published 91 peer-reviewed publications, including in top journals such as Blood, along with five book chapters. Uh, she's a reviewer of many journals. She has organized symposia and conferences and presented at numerous national and international conferences. Didn't I tell you she's a superstar? Um, in addition to all these accomplishments, uh, Dr. Logavi has been a force in promoting a field of hematopathology. If you haven't already, uh, please follow her Twitter account, which is at Sanam Logavi. You'll definitely learn a lot. I've learned a lot and I highly recommend it. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Logavi and I look forward to a talk entitled the critical role of state-of-the-art hematopathology in implementing precision oncology for myeloid malignancies. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, that was very, very uh, kind. I don't even know what to say. Um, hopefully I won't let you down. Um, I'm gonna talk to you guys about basically our role as hematopathologist um, in the diagnosis and surveillance of patients with heme malignancies, mostly myeloid neoplasms, and how our work translates into uh, decision making in clinical care. And hopefully, you know, I'll show you some examples of cases that will um, shed a light on what it is we do on a daily basis in a tertiary cancer center for these patients. I have no conflicts of interest. Um, the outline of the talk uh, will include a brief introduction about MD Anderson patients, um, our case numbers, uh, what our heme path workflow is like. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about measurable residual disease in acute myeloid leukemia. Um, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of clonal hematopoiesis post AML induction and what its implications are for measurable residual disease detection. Uh, I'll review the fitness landscape of clonal hematopoiesis following cytotoxic therapy uh, and whether or not it has implications for donor selection for patients going on to hematopoietic stem cell transplant. Uh, I'll show you a couple of examples of incidental secondary myeloid neoplasms uh, and how our hematopathology workup um, helps recognize these specific entities. And then I'll talk a little bit about blasted plasma cytoid dendritic cell neoplasms, uh, just because this topic is very close to my heart, and I thought I would share a little bit about um, it with you. So um, we see about 400 to 500 patients with newly diagnosed AML at MD Anderson annually. Uh, this is about 3% of the U.S. patients. So according to the SEER data, uh, in 2019, we had about 20, 21,000 newly diagnosed AML patients. Um, this accounts for about 1.2% 1, 1 of all new cancer cases um, and about 1.8% of all cancer deaths. So what does this uh, translate into in terms of our, our hematopathology workload? Uh, 
Um, in 2018, we saw about 13,000 bone marrows, and this includes obviously patients with myeloid and lymphoid malignancies, myeloma, and so on and so forth. Um, we did flow cytometry on approximately 26,000 cases, and of these, 2,800 were done for AML MRD detection. Um, so this is a slide um, that I borrowed from Dr. Courtney DiNardo, who's a leukemia physician at, um, at MD Anderson. She's a star. Um, this is basically the, the current paradigm uh, for newly diagnosed AML uh, and how we treat these patients at MD Anderson. And I just want to highlight here that basically after assessing the patient characteristics, including age, comorbidities, performance status, your next step really is, um, you know, it, it, it's dependent on the HEMAPATH workup, right? So we're doing a comprehensive profiling of acute myeloid leukemia using mostly bone marrow, but in patients that have a sufficient number of uh, circulating blasts, sometimes we use peripheral blood for this, uh, for this assessment. And we basically look at the morphology, the amino phenotype, the cytogenetic characteristics, and the molecular analysis, including mutations. And based on our findings, the patients are stratified into different arms. And as you know, most patients at MD Anderson are treated on clinical trials. So the information that we want to know immediately, basically within a couple of days of diagnosis, is whether the patient has a core binding factor, acute myeloid leukemia, whether or not they're FLT3 mutated, and whether or not they have IDH2 or IDH1 mutations. Um, and then obviously, you know, the uh, history of chemotherapy or a prior or preceding history of a chronic myeloid neoplasm also informs the treatment choice. Um, so how do we work these patients up? Uh, basically, when the bone marrow is done on the day of, uh, we get the aspirate smears and a touch imprint of the bone marrow core biopsy, which we review and, you know, we give a blast count on the same day. Uh, on that same day, we, uh, I think we're among the few institutions that are still doing cytochemical stains, but we find it very helpful because it's rapid and it's inexpensive. We do cytochemistry for MPO and for butyrate esterase or non, uh, uh, or NSE, and this is reported on the same day as well, right? So we know whether or not, in the majority of the cases, we know whether or not it's a myeloid leukemia or a um, lymphoid leukemia. Uh, and then we get a preliminary scatter based on the flow cytometry analysis where we look at CD45, CD34, and CD19. Again, this gives us a rough idea of the lineage of the leukemia. And then we get our flow cytometry full panel the next day. We do a routine karyotype on all newly diagnosed myeloid neoplasms. Uh, this is usually resulted out in three to eight days. We do FISH for PML RARA, core binding factor beta rearrangement, 821 translocation, or RUNCS1, RUNCS1, T1, and then BCR ABLE1 um, for all newly diagnosed leukemias. And this is usually uh, resulted out in four hours. So we get these results back in <clears throat> on the same day. And then we do additional FISH as needed um, based on the karyotypic abnormalities or based on, let's say, the presence of peripheral eosinophilia um, or other parameters like that. And we also do a complete molecular diagnostic workup, which includes FLT3 for ITD mutations and tyrosine kinase domain mutations. This is done by capillary electrophoresis because, as you know, NGS has a lot of problems with detecting ITD mutations. And then we do uh, an NGS panel. Uh, we're able to result 10 genes, and I'll show you what those 10 genes are within two days of diagnosis. And then our comprehensive 81 gene panel is usually resulted out in three to five days. And we also do a screening leukemia translocation panel that's resulted out in four to seven days. So this is our rapid, um, the preliminary um, panel that includes the 10 genes. And these 10 genes were chosen basically because either they have treatment implications or their you know, genes like MPN type genes, such as JAK2, calreticulin, or MIPL, that help inform the diagnosis. And then um, our more extensive panel, uh, which includes 81 genes, is later reported in three to five days. So we know that the prognosis for patients with, with AML is highly variable. Um, there are certain characteristics that are pretreatment characteristics that we know inform the prognosis, such as age, karyotype, or the mutational profile. 
And then also other things that inform the prognosis are chemosensitivity, whether or not the patient achieves complete remission, meaning their blast count, their bone marrow blast count goes to less than 5% and they recover their blood counts. Um, and then also in patients less than 60 years of age who do achieve a complete remission, the cure rate is, at best rate is 50%. And it's also worse for older individuals. Uh, so we know that morphological assessment of response is not sufficient for predicting outcome. And this is important because our clinical colleagues use this information to select the appropriate treatment for these patients, whether or not to take the patients to transplant. Um, so this is where measurable residual disease assessment comes in, right? So we know now that measurable residual disease and AML is highly prognostic, and it sometimes supersedes pretreatment characteristics. However, there's various uh, caveats to MRD detection at this time, uh, mostly that it's not standardized across the fields. Not all laboratories across the country are doing the same assay. Uh, we don't really know what the optimal MRD assay is at this point, when is the appropriate time to do MRD detection, and whether or not our findings should guide treatment. So there are several uh, methods to detect uh, MRD. Some of the older methods, such as FISH and PCR, um, you know, we've been using the, those for years now. Uh, FISH, we know, has a sensitivity of about 1% or 10 to the minus two. It's useful when you have a numeric cytogenetic abnormality, but it, you know, it's low in sensitivity and it's only applicable in about 50% of cases because the other 50% have normal karyotype. Flow cytometry is highly sensitive, it's rapid, it's relatively inexpensive. You can use it in more than 90% of AMLs because more than 90% of AMLs have abnormalities that you can detect by flow cytometry. However, the caveat here is that there is potential for phenotypic shifts. As you'll see, I'll show you some cases. Uh, AML MRD is not as straightforward as BALL MRD. It does require a lot of expertise. It's very difficult actually to do. You know, a lot of the times we think of what happens in the laboratory, you know, you feed some data to a machine and then it spits out a result for you. It really isn't like that. I have MR, AML MRD cases that I have to struggle with for hours. Um, so, you know, and sometimes it's pretty straightforward, but there are cases that are not. And then, um, you know, like I said, there's very limited standardization. Um, PCR is highly sensitive. It's well standardized. Uh, but you need to have a target that you're looking for, right? If you have a normal karyotype and you don't really have any molecular targets, you can't use PCR. And then it's time consuming and labor intensive and it, it has long turnaround times. NGS in most clinical laboratories, the sensitivity is about 1%. The advantage is that you can look for multiple gene mutations at one time. The interpretation is relatively simple if you have the appropriate bioinformatic pipelines. Uh, but again, the results are confounded by the presence of clonal hematopoiesis, and I sh I'll show you some examples of this. It is relatively expensive. It's really not standardized across the field. And like I said, it requires a sophisticated bioinformatic pipeline and support. So, you know, there are many uh, very nice studies that show the prognostic impact of AML-MRD by flow cytometry, showing that it affects both the incidence of relapse and the overall survival in patients with AML. Um, there are similar studies that show that when you look for mutations, when you look for minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease by mutation, again, it informs the prognosis. Um, and NPM1 is a good mutation to use for this, uh, for this purpose, but as I'll show you later, there are other mutations that are really not useful for this purpose. This is a really nice paper that was recently published in JCO by Chris Ferrigan and his team, and they showed that basically the uh, conditioning regimens um, should be different in patients with uh, post-therapy residual disease by, you know, by uh, genomic uh, evidence of residual disease and those that don't. Basically, patients that have uh, evidence of mutation positivity by NGS and receive reduced intensity uh, conditioning regimens tend to do much worse than those who receive myeloablative therapy. Uh, and then you can see that, you know, they, uh, here they stratified the patients by the type of therapy they received and the risk of relapse by, um, by their different mutations. Uh, 
Uh, so basically, you know, you can see that the, a lot of the patients on the uh, reduced intensity um, arm uh, relapsed uh, post-treatment. Uh, post so unlike BALL, MRD, as I said, there is no standard uh, approach. So how do we do this? What do we look for? So we look for leukemia-associated immunophenotypes. And what that means is we look for aberrant antigen expression. We look for asynchronous antigen expression. So myeloid progenitors have a very, very well-defined maturation pattern um, that you know, is easily recognizable as normal. Um, so there's very, um, very little variation in terms of normal myeloid progenitors. Uh, so once you see asynchronous antigen, mat or antigen maturation patterns, um, especially if the patient is not treated, that's highly reliable. However, you know, there are reactive patterns of regeneration that can look very scary by flow cytometry, but you know, we've come to learn uh, these patterns and you know, are trying to use these when we, uh, when we interpret our data. And then also variation in intensity of antigen expression. Uh, for instance, CD38 on normal myeloid progenitors should be highly expressed and it's usually bright. In MDS or acute myeloid leukemia, it's often downregulated. So we use this as a sign of antigen uh, or aberrancy. And then also variations from normal, right? So this is often used for patients, you know, we're a referral center. A lot of the times we get uh, patients after they've already been treated. So we don't know what the original leukemia looks like. So we use variations from normal to say that this is an aberrant phenotype. But again, this is difficult to interpret because antigen expression in regeneration can be variable. Um, so in terms of looking for measurable residual disease by NGS, what do we look for? We look for persistent or new mutations because we know AML, especially post-relapse, can often have clonal evolution. Um, we know that AML is clonally heterogeneous uh, and that the mutational landscape changes. So this is a confounding factor for us. Uh, and then also we know that not all mutations are created equally, right? So as I said, NPM1 can be very informative, uh, but persistent mutations in the genes that are often implicated in clonal hematopoiesis, such as GNMT3A, TET2, or ASXL1, are not very informative in terms of determining the risk of relapse. Um, so what are the clinical implications of AML-MRD? So the Euro European Leukemia Net indicates that complete remission without MRD is a criterion of official AML response criterion. However, um, this is not well standardized in, in our country. Um, and then NGS and flow are used complementary, right? So uh, leukemia-associated mutations and aberrant surface protein expression, as I'll show you in some cases, are used to determine the presence of measurable residual disease. Um, so this is a paper that was published basically showing that, sorry, persistent mutations in DNMT3A, TET2, and ASXL1 is not associated with increased risk of, risk of relapse. And we often see this in, in our patients, right? They often have multiple mutations. Um, the, the, more, the later mutations, such as FLT3 or NPM1, um, often disappear after you induce these patients, but the, the more early mutations or more stem cell, uh, or stem cell mutations, such as the DTA mutations, often persist. Uh, and this does not relatively mean that, the, uh, does not necessarily mean that the patient is going to relapse. Sorry. Okay. Um, so in order to walk you through the next few slides, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about clonal hematopoiesis and how it um, translates into difficulties for us in interpreting uh, measurable residual disease following therapy. Um, so the definition of clonal hematopoiesis is basically the presence of clonal mutations in hematopoietic stem cell and progenitor cells in the absence of overt hematologic disease. We know very well that the incidence increases with age. Basically, almost everyone above the age of 40 has, muta has DNMT3A mutations. This is something that I learned from Russell Beaton. Most commonly, one or a few mutations in genes recognized as early events in myeloid neoplasms, including epigenetic modifiers, splicing factors, um, and then also TP53 and JAK2 are recurrent mutations in clonal hematopoiesis as well. 
Um, so it is increased in incidence in patients with solid tumors, which also may be as a result of its association with increasing age. And it does have potential association with prior exposure to oncologic therapy or chemotherapy. So this is the initial paper that actually showed, um, you know, in, in a series of healthy uh, patients or, you know, patients without uh, hematologic malignancies, um, where they discovered mutations in DNMT3A, TET2A, SXL1, and so on and so forth, and showed that the incidence increases with age and that the presence of clonal hematopoiesis is associated with an increased probability of hematologic malignancies. Okay, so we know that clonal hematopoiesis can precede AML development, but what happens after you treat patients with AML? What is the fate of clonal hematopoiesis? Um, what happens to the clonal size? What are the long-term effects of patients or in patients that have residual clonal hematopoiesis following induction therapy? And this is a um, study that was presented this year by, um, by um, Koichi Takahashi and um, one of his very brilliant postdoc fellows, Dr. Tanaka. This was presented at ASH. And they looked at a series of patients that had post-CR clonal hematopoiesis. Um, so a lot of the patients had persistent clonal hematopoiesis, meaning they had the same mutations that they had in the AML. Some had both persistent, a fewer number, about nine patients had uh, both persistent and emerging clonal hematopoiesis. And they also had one person that had a new mutation following therapy that was not present in the uh, original AML. And as you can see here, it's the same genes that are implicated, right? DNMT3A, TET2, SRSF2 are very commonly mutated, but you also see genes like IDH2 um, and, you know, BRUNX1, NF1 with a fewer frequency. So let's look, in a, look at an example. So this is one patient that was treated with chemotherapy. You can see that at diagnosis, these are the variant allelic frequencies of the various mutation, and on the right side, you have the blast count. So when they treat the patient and the blast count goes down, the mutations in NPM1 and NRAS go down, but you can see that DNMT3A and TET2 mutations actually persist. Same here with, a patient, with another patient who gets treated. Um, here, the, the mutations, um, the, the more leukemogenic mutations uh, go away when the blast count reduces, but you can see that the DNMT3A mutation persists. Um, however, unlike chemotherapy, they found that allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant, as you would expect, is able to eradicate the mutation, right? So here the patient has a DNMT3A mutation that's persisting, but once they're transplanted, the DNMT3A mutation disappears. Same here with the WT1 mutation, uh, when, you know, they, the mutation basically disappears following allogeneic stem cell transplant. Um, so we tried to look at, uh, we, you know, tried to take a multimodality approach and look at these patients with post-clonal, post-remission clonal hematopoiesis um, and see what it translates into in terms of protein expression or flow cytometry, right? Because that's important for us for AML MRD detection and how we result these and how we report these aberrancies. So this will be presented as a um, virtual, I guess, poster in the ASCO 2020, um, the upcoming meeting. So I'll show you an example of a patient, a 61-year-old man uh, with newly diagnosed AML. As you can see on the bone marrow aspirate, the majority of the cells here are immature blasts. Uh, and the bone marrow clot section here shows that the normal hematopoietic elements are essentially replaced by blasts. So this is the baseline NGS at diagnosis. The patient has an ASXL1, an IDH2, TP53, and U2AF1 mutations. Um, when you look at the baseline flow cytometry findings, we're just basically including the, the aberrant myeloid blasts here. Um, they're CD34 positive. As I said, they have reduced CD38. Uh, they're positive for, by, for 13, but they, um, they're completely negative for 33, which is abnormal. They have very bright expression of CD117, which is also abnormal, and they have reduced expression of HLA-DR, another aberrancy. When you look at the post-induction um, sample, and this is, you know, this is sent for AML-MRD detection, basically this looks very different uh, compared with the top panel, right? So now you have CD38, which is much brighter, 
Um, this is almost a normal pattern for CD13 and CD33 expression, what we call a boomerang pattern. You have a mild increase in CD117 and CD123 expression. So this is a little bit alarming, but as I said, it looks nothing like the original leukemia. And as you can see, the CD117 here is much dimmer than the original leukemia. So what do we do with this? Because we know that increased CD117 and increased CD123 expression is a sign of aberrancy. What do we report this? Is this residual AML or not? So let's look at the mutations. At baseline, the patient has, these are IGV reads from the, um, from the NGS analysis. And basically where you see a letter here, it means that the, the wild type base has been replaced. Um, and then this, this um, little gap here is a deletion. So they have uh, mutations in TP53 and ASXL1, and these mutations tend to persist in the post remission sample. You still ha have the mutation in both genes. Um, you have U a U2AF1 insertion at baseline and post-induction, but you can see that the IDH2 mutation that was present at high allelic frequency at baseline is no longer present. This is, you know, virtually um, wild type. So we say, what, what do we conclude from this? That residual clonal hematopoiesis translates to phenotypic alterations, but it's not necessarily residual AML, right? So we have to be careful with reporting out these findings. This is another example uh, of a 57-year-old man who had an acute myeloid leukemia arising from chronic myelomyelocytic leukemia. Here again, the bone marrow is replaced by sheets of immature cells on the bone marrow aspirate. You have um, numerous blasts. Uh, the baseline NGS shows a mutation in Sybil, NPM1, SRSF2, and TET2. Um, they do a post-induction bone marrow and you know, you look at this and it looks pretty scary. You still have a lot of immature cells, uh, mononuclear, open chromatin. Um, they look like blasts on the aspirate uh, diff. And these were counted as 12%. So what is this, residual AML or not? You know, if you go by a morphologic assessment only in a patient with AML that has 12% residual blasts, that's basically AML, right? Because it, it contradicts the definition of less than 5% blasts. But if you come here and look at the phenotypic characteristics of these two samples, here at baseline, you can see that there's a large population of monocytes based on the CD45 site scatter gate. These monocytes um, have some that are negative for CD13, which is abnormal. Most mature monocytes should have bright expression of CD13. They have increased expression of CD123. They have increased expression of CD15. And there's a large subset of them that is CD14 negative, also another sign of immaturity in monocytes. When you look at the post-induction bone marrow, while the monocytic count here is, um, you know, it's very increased. We have about 73% monocytes, but the phenotype here looks different. They, no they now have uniform expression of CD13, the CD123 is dimmer compared to the presentation sample. There is no expression of 15, and the vast majority of them have CD14 expression. When you look at the mutation profile, um, sorry, here the, the two reads are flipped. So the top panel is the post-induction. Um, the TET2 mutation is present in both samples. A Sybil missense mutation is present in both samples. Um, as is the SRSF2. However, you can see that the NPM1 insertion mutation is no longer present. So this patient has likely reverted back to their underlying CMML, but this is not residual AML. So to summarize this section, uh, we use NGS and flow as complementary methods in the follow-up of patients with AML. Um, I think we can conclude that post-treatment clonal hematopoiesis may be associated with phenotypic abnormalities, but it's not necessarily residual AML. Uh, consolidation and maintenance therapy have minimal effect on post-remission clonal hematopoiesis, but allogeneic stem cell transplant may be curative. And our early data suggests that clonal hematopoiesis is not associated with increased risk of relapse, and we'll show you more details about the phenotypic alterations that are associated with these abnormalities um, at ASCO. Uh, so how about clonal hematopoiesis and secondary or therapy-related myeloid neoplasms? Uh, so we know that clonal hematopoiesis is associated with increased risk of therapy myeloid neoplasms, right? Uh, 
Um, so this was a paper by Koichi Takahashi uh, published in Lancet Oncology in 2017, where he showed that basically patients that had clonal hematopoiesis had an increased incidence or cumulative incidence of therapy-related myeloid neoplasms following chemotherapy. Uh, so basically, one of the models that is accepted now is that when you have clonal hematopoiesis, some of these clones have a growth or survival advantage uh, under chemotherapy pressure, right? So the wild type cells die while these stay alive. Um, and then uh, once you, you know, when you, these clones expand and then they acquire additional mutations that gives rise to secondary myeloid neoplasms. But is there more? So I'll show you an example of a patient uh, who, a 68-year-old man who had a history of B lymphoblastic leukemia in 2012. He was treated with chemo and received an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant. He received, uh, or he uh, presented with a liver mass in 2017. Uh, and he, um, at the time, his CBC showed mild leukopenia. He had anemia, a macrocytic anemia, and his platelet count was normal. So the liver uh, mass uh, was basically sheets of glass, both uh, forming a mass and also with intrasinusoidal infiltration. These cells are PAX5 positive and TDT positive, consistent with a patient's history of BALL. So this is recurrent BALL involving the liver. However, when you look at the bone marrow, the patient, you know, there, there is trilineal hematopoiesis. However, you have some small megakaryocytes here. I'm pointing, pointing them out uh, with the orange arrows. Um, you have an abnormal megakaryocyte here with separation of the nuclear lobes on the bone marrow smear. And then also you have some dyspoiesis, some dysgranulopoiesis uh, on the smears. So, um, you know, obviously because of the patient's history of BALL, we did an MRD flow assay for BALL, which was negative, and this assay has a sensitivity of 10 to the minus 4, so it's pretty sensitive. And the engraftment studies still showed 100% donor DNA. Um, so we did next generation sequencing on the bone marrow, and there is a TP53 mutation that has a variant allele frequency of about 43%. Uh, so we know that the, the specimen is not involved by BALL. So what is this TP53 mutation here? Is this a germline mutation? Is it a somatic mutation? And what does it mean? So because of these findings and because of the, um, the dysplasia and the, um, the cytopenias, uh, we did flow cytometry for MDS. And you know, here we can see a distinct CD34 positive population. It's negative for CD19, so we know these are not BALL or B lymphoblasts and it's positive for CD13. And here, the monocytes show uniform expression of CD56, which is also a marker of aberrancy. The karyotype here shows trisomy 8. Um, so this confirms a diagnosis of myeloid, myelodysplastic syndrome. However, we know that the patient still has 100% donor DNA, right? So this is a donor-derived myelodysplastic syndrome. And so what does this mean in terms of donor selection? This is an example that shows you that basically maybe this donor had a TP53 mutant clone as clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential, but when you transplant a patient with a, uh, from a donor that has clonal hematopoiesis, um, you know, are they at increased risk for developing secondary myeloid neoplasms? Uh, so these two papers were rec recently published in uh, Blood Advances. They're both in the same issue. Uh, and they're basically opinion pieces. One says stem cell donors should not be screened for clonal hematopoiesis, and the other says stem cell donors should be screened for clonal hematopoiesis. So what are the two arguments that the, the authors are making? Uh, so before we talk about that, I'll show you this paper that basically shows um, where they um, screened 500 healthy donors um, for clonal hematopoiesis, and they showed that you know, a fraction of donors do have clonal hematopoiesis, again, in the same genes that are implicated in, in other healthy individuals. And here they showed that actually it does not, the presence of clonal hematopoiesis in the donor does not impact survival in, in the recipient, right? Uh, but basically people that are in favor of donor screening, their argument is that you know, clonal hematopoiesis is rare. Um, in general, it's rare and it's much more rare in patients that are younger, right? 
Um, and the majority of the, the stem cell um, donors are young patients, right? Because the, the donor registry or the donor program prioritizes donors that are under 45 years. Um, most patients that receive allogeneic stem cell transplants, um, you know, if, they, if they're receiving it from a related donor, um, they may receive it from a sibling. And we know that patients with myeloid malignancies are usually older. And this means that their siblings are probably in the same age range and are older. Uh, so they are advocating for basically screening these older related patients. And they're saying that this is a very small fraction of the entire donor pool. So it may be financially um, and um, you know, maybe feasible to actually do this. And the, the people that are opposed to the screening are basically saying that, you know, we still need more criteria. We need consensus guidelines that basically follow um, these several basics. One is we need to know what, you know, we, ha we have to have a uniform definition of clonal hematopoiesis, which I think at, at this point is pretty well established. But we need to show a clear link between clonal hematopoiesis and transplant-related outcomes and also, we need to have a combined strategy for clinical actionability in donors and recipients. So I'll show you another example of a patient. This is a 36-year-old woman with AML with inversion 3. Um, as you can see at baseline, she has a very dysplastic-looking bone marrow. The megakaryocytes are bizarre-looking. They're very small, typical, actually, for inversion 3. Uh, and she has increased CD34 positive myeloid blasts. Um, and the karyotype at this point shows the presence of inversion 3 in four metaphases. So she receives an allogeneic hematopoietic stem cell transplant in 2017. It's continued uh, on surveillance. She's been MRD negative throughout until um, um, August. And then in, uh, this is August of 2018. And then in February of 2019, she presents with mild macrocytosis, mild relative monocytosis, and gets a repeat bone marrow with uh, a comprehensive workup. So the, uh, morphologically, the bone marrow looks like it's in remission. There's trilinear tomatopoiesis, there's no dysplasia, the megakaryocytes now look normal, and there's only about 1% loss. We do flow cytometry to look for residual AML, and while we don't see an increased number of CD34 positive blasts, here you see a distinct population that is CD117 negative, and CD34 positive. So this should always alarm you, right? This is not normal maturation. You have to explain what these cells are. They could be erythroid progenitors, they could be early NK cells, but you basically have to look at further characteristics and make, you know, determine what they are. So we did that, and uh, you know, here we can see that the CD117 positive cells are CD34 negative, and they are in fact HLA-DR positive, so they're not erythroid progenitors. Um, we had a karyotype at the time, it was diploid, and FISH was negative for inversion 3. And the microsatellite uh, polymorphism showed 100% myeloid cells of donor uh, origin. And we know that the previous AML blasts were CD34 positive. So how do we explain these? So if you know, um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you know, um, that NPM1 mutated uh, leukemias have usually a CD34 negative uh, phenotype that is CD117 positive, a lot of the times they can actually lack HLA-DR as well. But this was something that was picked up by the very brilliant Sa Wang uh, on uh, follow-up. So here, you know, um, I'm showing you that basically CD34 and CD117 in normal myeloid maturation should be expressed together. Uh, promyelocytes lack CD34 um, but, you know, they, they also have other characteristics. They have CD15, which these cells didn't. So we know that they're abnormal. So we send this for NGS. And of course, there is an NPM1 mutation. Uh, you know, this was completely unsuspected uh, and was only picked up because of the, the abnormal flow population. But what does this mean for the patient? So by WHO criteria, if you have a myeloid neoplasm that develops after the patient has received chemotherapy, so we know that this is not recurrent AML, it's not the original clone, right? But is it therapy-related AML? I would argue that it probably isn't. It's probably a secondary de novo AML. So not all myeloid neoplasms that, um, uh, that, are, you know, that occur after chemotherapy are therapy-related myeloid leukemias. And I think this is important, and it's important to explain in your pathology report 
because it does matter prognostically, right? This patient is likely going to do better than a patient that develops a therapy-related myeloid leukemia with an MLL rearrangement. Okay, let's switch gears and talk a little bit about blastic plasma cytodendritic cells. So uh, we know that BPTCN is a rare hematopoietic malignancy. It has a bimodal incidence, uh, usually peaks either in children under 20 years of age or in older individuals that are older than 60. It commonly involves the skin, bone marrow, and lymph nodes, and it has a strong association with chronic myeloid neoplasms, namely CMML. Um, the, our colleagues, um, you know, this, was, this is a study that was led by Naveen Pamaraju, but also um, with Andy Lane um, from Harvard and uh, many other authors, and this was published in the New England Journal of uh, Medicine in 2019, where they reported the results of the first multicenter prospective clinical trial using the SL401 Tugruxafus, or the anti-CD123 drug. Um, about 45% of the patients uh, were able to be bridged to stem cell transplantation in this study, and this drug is now approved by the FDA for use in BPDCN. Uh, but we know that hematopoietic stem cell transplantation is basically the only curative treatment option, uh, and patients can, you know, sometimes receive autologous or allogeneic cell, stem cell transplants. Uh, so this is a patient that was very recently published by our group, read by, led by Wei Wang and Sa Wang, uh, and we looked at neoplastic plasma cytoidendritic cells uh, by flow cytometry, um, uh, basically how, to, and we showed how to distinguish them uh, from uh, normal plasma cytoidendritic cells, and also um, show the utility of flow cytometry for MRD assessment. So basically, um, with, uh, for neoplastic plasma cytoidendritic cells, or blastic plasma cytoidendritic cells, you have uh, various characteristic patterns that are uh, either increased or gain in an aberrant antigen or increased intensity in a normal antigen that is now expressed at a brighter level or loss or decreased intensity of an antigen that is normally present. So CD56 here was present in about 97% of cases. There was aberrant gain of CD7 in more than half of the cases and HLA-DR showed increased intensity in 69% of cases. CD38% was commonly, uh, intensity was commonly reduced. CD2 was commonly reduced. CD303, which is thought to be a specific marker of, uh, plastic, or of plasma cytodendritic cells, was lost or apparently decreased in more than half of the cases. And CD123 also was decreased in 78%. And the MRD panel, based on these characteristics, was validated to a sensitivity of 0.01%. Um, so it's important to note that one of the, one of the major findings in this, uh, in this paper is that you know, people often think of CD56 expression in plasma cytodendritic cells as a sign of um, neoplasia or aberrancy. But it's important to note that reactive plasma cytodendritic cells consistently have a small subset that is positive for CD56. Now this can range from 1.3 to about 20% with a median of 4.5%. So this does introduce a caveat for MRD detection. However, what's very helpful as shown in these two examples, so the top panel with the red uh, events shows uh, a BPDCN case, and the bottom panel is um, reactive normal plasma cytodendritic cells. So while these are CD56 positive, they are consistently positive for CD2, so they don't show loss of CD2 expression. They are consistently positive for CD303, and they show bright CD38 expression and are negative for CD7. So the only thing they have is CD56 expression. They don't have any other aberrancies, and this is very important to know if you're doing flow cytometry uh, for plasma cytodendritic cell neoplasm. Um, so how about the prognostic impact of the site of involvement? This is a really nice paper uh, published by Justin Taylor and Andy Lane. Uh, this was in Blood in 2019. Uh, this was also a multi-center analysis of outcomes in uh, patients with blastic plasma cytodendritic cells. And they showed very nicely that basically the site of involvement is really not a prognostic indicator, right? So they looked at patients that had skin-only involvement, 
systemic only with or without, or sorry, without skin or skin and systemic involvement. And they showed that what does uh, inform prognosis is if the patient is older than 60 years or if they have an abnormal uh, karyotype. These two were associated with poor outcomes. So let's see if we can explain this. And let's see if there is a significance to hematopoietic stem cells, your bone marrow hematopoietic stem cells in patients with bone marrow with blastic plasmacytic dendritic cells. So this is an example of a 79-year-old man with skin BPDCN. Uh, you know, we do a staging bone marrow in these patients. Every patient gets a staging bone marrow. And, and we use this very nice stain. This is a dual, we uh, published this. This was led by um, our, um, my friend and colleague, Dr. Joe Corey. We published it in AJSP uh, last year. And we show, uh, here you can see a cluster of uh, CD123 and TCF4 positive cells. The, this is highly characteristic for plasma cytoid dendritic cells. It doesn't tell you that they're neoplastic, but it tells you that these are plasma cytoid dendritic cells. So you can see that the involvement is very focal. The majority of the, the bone marrow is uninvolved, but it is involved. It has focal involvement by uh, BPDCN, and we know that these were neoplastic because by flow they had an aberrant phenotype. When you look at the next generation sequencing of the bone marrow, you see multiple mutations at, var you know, at variable uh, variant allele frequencies ranging from 2% and up to 30%. So let's go back and look. This involvement by the blastic plasma cytodendritic cell neoplasm is very low, right? It's less than 5%. And this does not explain the variant allele frequencies in the bone marrow. So there must be other cell lineages in here that are mutated, right? As opposed to this 34-year-old man who presents with skin BPDCN, the bone marrow is unremarkable in morphology, uninvolved by BPDCN, by flow and IHC, and NGS shows no mutations, right? So they have normal hematopoietic stem cells. If you compare these two patients by flow cytometry and look at their hematopoietic stem cells, this is the patient uh, with, with the uh, mutations. They have, as I told you, they have decreased CD38 positivity, which is a sign of aberrancy. They have increased 117 expression, again, a sign of aberrancy, and their monocytes show uniform expression of CD56. Whereas the younger man without, clonal, you know, without evidence of clonality in their stem cells by NGS has a perfectly normal pattern of myeloid progenitor cells. They have the nice boomerang panel uh, pattern, they have bright CD38 expression, and they have a normal pattern of CD117 expression, and their monocytes look normal. So, Essentially, you're looking at two groups of patients, right? There are patients that have clonal hematopoiesis, they have gene mutations and an abnormal phenotype in their myeloid stem cells, and then there are patients that have skin involvement that have healthy stem cells. They have no mutations in the bone marrow, no phenotypic changes. And this suggests that there is a different biology, right? Some of these BPDCNs are associated with an underlying stem cell disorder, and some of them present de novo. So this is important because it has implications for therapy, right? So you do not want to give the patient with abnormal hematopoietic stem cells an autologous stem cell transplant. Whereas if they have normal stem cells, then this patient probably can receive an autologous uh, stem cell transplant and doesn't have to be subject to an allotransplant. And perhaps evaluation of hematopoietic stem cells is a better predictor of outcome than just looking at the site of involvement, right? Um, and that's all I have. Uh, and these are my acknowledgments. Um, you know, our wonderful hematopathology group, we have, I think, 34 hematopathologists in our group. I'm not naming them all here, but they are all wonderful, helpful, and I feel so fortunate to work with all of them. Um, our leukemia colleagues, um, which are great collaborators for all of us, uh, the Loyola pathology team, and Virtual Path GR for inviting me. And thank you so much, and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Logavi. This, is, this has really been wonderful, just so eye-opening, excellent talk, and so educational. I'm sure everyone is taking something away from this, which is fantastic. One of the things I miss about Grand Rounds being virtual is the inability for you to hear the applause, which I'm sure uh, you are getting a lot <laughs> of. I did want to tell everybody, though, that if you move your cursor to the bottom of your screen or look in your phone, there is a reactions button, uh, and you can either give a thumbs up or a clap, and so please feel free to do that so Dr. Logavi can also feel that emotion. Um, so I've already posted uh, a clickable link. Uh, you can copy paste it into uh, 
any browser for your evaluations. You can also now, um, the forum is open for questions. There is one already, Dr. Logavi. The first question is from Dr. Umar Iqbal, and he's wondering um, why, in your opinion, do you think that the PD-1 and the PDL one therapies have been kind of disappointing so far in multiple myeloma? And, you know, in your opinion, what are some of the other promising checkpoint and target inhibitors that you can think of? For myeloma? So, you know, he's, I think the question was related to just the checkpoint inhibitor therapy for myeloma. But in general, like, what do you think is up and coming for checkpoint inhibitors? Yeah, so, you know, we have a few trials. I'm not exactly sure about myeloma. I don't know, but I know that we have a few trials uh, with nivolumab and um, AML. Um, so far, they've actually not been very promising, uh, but they're still ongoing. Um, so, right. you know, I guess right. the jury so is out. Happy. Yeah, wait and see, I guess. Dr. Shafina Hussain asks, uh, she says, thank you for this amazing talk. Uh, she has a question about how to determine therapy-related myeloid neoplasm from de novo myeloid neoplasm post-treatment. Yeah, I think that's a great question. And that's something that, you know, we struggle with. Um, so I think more than, the, uh, more than just the history of therapy, which, which was something that, you know, we used to do, right? So historically, if a patient had... Um, a history of exposure to chemotherapy, they would basically be classified as a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm. But I think over the years, as we do more genomic testing, we've learned that a lot of these, not a lot, but a subset of these patients actually have a second de novo myeloid neoplasm. And I think what's more informative in terms of prognosis is actually the genetics, right? So if you have, you know, there are genetics that are frequently associated with therapy-related myeloid neoplasms, like the MLL or the KMT2A uh, rearrangement, or, you know, abnormalities of chromosome 7, or abnormalities of chromosome 5, or a complex karyotype. So I think with those, I would feel better calling something a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm as opposed to the patient who presents with a normal karyotype and an MPM1 mutation. Right. So I, I don't know if this is a right approach or not, but what I've been doing, and I think a lot of my colleagues in our group do, is we actually, you know, characterize the AML and the diagnostic line by its genetics. And then we also say that the history of chemotherapy is noted. And then in a comment, you know, we say if, if the genetics jive well with the therapy, uh, and, you know, if they look, if there's complex karyotype, there's um, alterations in, um, in um, chromosomes that are associated with therapy-related myeloid neoplasms, we say this is probably a therapy-related myeloid neoplasm. But if the genetics say otherwise, we actually alert them and say, you know, this can definitely be a de novo. And, you know, we, we realize that the patient's been treated, but this can be de novo. Wonderful. No, thank you for that. Uh, Dr. Enrique Colado um, is asking, I'm just going to read it out. He says, we have encountered some AML cases with partial plasma cytoid dendritic cell differentiation, but not quote, no, quote enough to include them in the BPDCN following the WHO criteria. How do you manage these in-between cases? Right. So, um, you know, I think there's... It if the meeting is still on, this is actually one of the, one of the categories that they were calling for uh, cases for the upcoming um, EAHP meeting in Dubrovnik. Uh, so this is a gray zone, right? Um, it's very rare, but we have also seen a couple of cases where you know, there's definitely um, BPDCN different or plasma cytodendritic cell uh, differentiation, but it's not enough to call. I think you just have to be honest, right? You say, this does not meet criteria, but there is, and especially if there's, you know, very bright CD123 expression, they may want to explore therapy with the anti-CD123. Um, but I think what you can, in terms of what you can do is you just describe your findings. You say that there is this, um, you know, that there is differentiation towards plasma cytodendritic cells, but it doesn't meet criteria. Wonderful. Uh, Dr. Sarah Javed Bishajiani says, thank you very much for this amazing talk. Do you need to go back and check the donor if you find abnormal clones in a recipient? If you, oh, um, well, yes and no, because um, I don't know what it, you know, retrospectively in terms of research, I think it's nice to know, but what are you going to do after you've already transplanted the patient? I right? guess, and she um, follow, right. She follows up by saying, and if it was in the donor, can we exclude therapy induced? Um, no, 
actually, I don't think you can exclude therapy induced, right? Because it's it's the same mechanism, right? Let's say it doesn't matter if the if the if the let's say the the TP53 mutant clone comes from the recipient or the donor. What you're doing is basically that that clone is expanding under under pressure of the therapy, right? right. So it's basically the same mechanism the origin may be different but i think it's the same mechanism so it can still be a therapy related but a donor derived absolutely it makes perfect sense dr kalyan nandiminti is asking can you please comment on gated two mutations in myeloid neoplasms and when to consider germline testing since vaf alone is not reliable yeah, so, um, you know, we have a germline clinic uh, that's run by Courtney DiNardo, um, which is actually very helpful for, uh, for these patients. So I think, you know, what, what is more informative than variant allele frequency alone is the history, um, the family history. But basically for us, for any newly diagnosed myeloid neoplasms with mutations that are in the range of heterozygous by variant allele frequency in genes like RUNX1, GATA, DDX41, or other um, germline predispositions, they get referred to the germline clinic, they get genetic counseling, and if it's further warranted, they do get a skin biopsy for germline testing. Wonderful. Uh, I think that's it. It's been an amazing response. Like I'm sure you can see the chat feature yourself, Dr. Lagavi. later. Everyone is thanking you uh, so much. And thank you again for your time and for answering all of these questions. And so uh, on behalf of both the Virtual Pathology Grand Rounds team and Loyola Medicine, we thank you again. Uh, and uh, everyone else, please, uh, you will be able to find this on our website, the recording, um, hopefully within a week. Uh, and tune in to our next one, which should be uh, posted on Twitter soon. Thank you very Thank much, you everyone. Thank you so much for having me and for tuning in, everyone.